Hello, everybody. It's really nice to have you all along here tonight. And welcome to what is going to be a fantastic event tonight that our young people at North Wales Wildlife Trust, our Wild Coast project, have brought together for you all today. Um, it's really nice to have you all come along to talk about what is arguably uh, one of the most underreported issues of the uh, 21st century in terms of nature and wildlife, which is the insect apocalypse. Um, it's been coined the insect apocalypse recently um, due to the fact that insects have been declining eight times faster than any other group of animals throughout the world. So it's really important that we have conversations around this topic and very important as well that we have more people doing more things at home to be able to support our insect life. Uh, insects are absolutely crucial to the survival of almost everything on earth. They are at the bottom of the food chain. They are fed upon by lots of other animals. Uh, they provide us with things like pollination services. They provide us with physical services. They recycle nutrients. They are all in all some of the most important things that are alive to humankind. So really important that we get together to have these conversations. Um, my name's Andy. I work on the Our Wild Coast project uh, in North Wales Wildlife Trust, which is our youth specific project aimed at inspiring and educating young people and the next generation about all things environment. Uh, we teach them about nature and wildlife. We do practical conservation days. Uh, we do surveying and we do have an awful lot of fun doing things like snorkeling, camping, kayaking and all that sort of stuff as well. Uh, unfortunately, the project's coming to an end at the end of March and this event tonight has been brought to you from the young people on the project as one of our sort of final events um, in the sort of series of our Wild Coast. Um, and through the support of uh, Ian at North Wales Wildlife Trust as well, through something called Wild the Future, uh, which is enabling people to get more enthused and educated about nature and wildlife to start making a bit of a change. So uh, the young people are really excited to have brought some really interesting debates here tonight. Uh, they've created and sort of brought together questions on things that they are passionate about, and they are going to be talking and doing everything tonight to try and educate a little bit, to raise awareness on different issues within different subjects, and to essentially start raising awareness of issues that not a lot of people do know about. Um, it's really great. It's going to be a great event. Uh, there's a question and answer function at the bottom of the screen. So throughout all of the debates tonight, uh, you can ask any questions. And when we get to the second half of the evening, uh, we'll have a question and answer panel session where we've got uh, some local conservation experts, uh, the Bangor University Conservation Society. Uh, and we've also got our young people who have learned an awful lot over the last few years who will be answering all the questions that you guys might have. Um, about insect decline and anything insect related. So please do use the question and answer function throughout the recording and throughout the Zoom and talk amongst each other about all of the issues that are being raised tonight and we will try and answer as many of the questions that you have as possible. So the young people tonight who are actually going to be debating, um, they have researched sort of two sides of a, set, a different argument. So they won't necessarily believe in the things that they are portraying, um, but they want to give as much of an unbiased view to these questions as possible, so that as many people can get as much information from both sides of the argument as possible. So uh, the young people have been researching different arguments and different sides of arguments to try and come to a bit of a consensus about what an overarching answer to this might um, be. So to get us underway, uh, we have two young people from the Arwal Coast Youth Forum uh, called Megan and Ellen, who I'd like to invite onto the screen now, who are going to be debating tonight as to whether pesticides should be banned immediately and as to whether pesticides are one of the most primary causes of insect decline across the UK and further afield. Um, it's going to be a really interesting debate. Uh, Megan's coming at it from a, a yes, pesticides should be completely banned tomorrow without sort of any second thought. They should be banned because they cause mass death in insect populations. Whereas Ellen is going to be talking about it from a position of, we shouldn't ban them straight away because we're not quite there yet. And we need to do a bit more research into other methods of how we can sort of combat insect decline and to sort of combat pests in agriculture as well. So Megan, I'd like to invite you first to sort of introduce your side of the argument, if, if you can, please. Um, okay, so hi, I'm Megan, and um, as Andy kind of um, explained, I'm coming at the angle that I think pesticides should be outright banned. 
Um, in the UK, insects are declining at an alarming rate, with a study done by Natural England finding that of the 2,430 British insect species, 55 have gone extinct and 286 are threatened. Um, one of the biggest drivers for this decline is the use of pesticides in agriculture, 98% of which don't actually reach their target species. Um, this obviously has huge environmental impacts. Um, and if something isn't done about this, not only will the natural environment suffer um, as a consequence, but we will lose some of the most important services that the ecosystem provides us with, with the pollination. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Megan. And Alan is going to be coming at this from the angle of they shouldn't be banned straight away. So would you like to introduce your side of the argument, Alan? Yeah, hi, I'm Ellen. I would have to disagree with Megan's uh, argument here. I do not think that they should be banned. Pesticides are not the only thing impacting insect populations. As UK Parliament research shows, both climate change and habitat loss also have significant impacts too. Though you cannot deny the effect on the environment that pesticides have, they are currently necessary, as not only do they protect the livelihoods of farmers and of other agricultural workers, but they also allow us to obtain high yields and maintain food security. They might not be the ideal solution, but until alternatives can be found, they're our best option. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Ellen. So to get this debate started then, the very wide arching question, uh, why are pesticides so bad? Um, well, I'm, I'm sure you've all heard and, you know, it's the is what our event is called today. Um, the insect apocalypse has been um, very prevalent in the media as of late. Um, an analysis of, one hit, uh, of 166 studies published in early 2020 as a follow up to this kind of media storm um, showed that there was an annual decline of 0.92% in insect biodiversity. Um, as our agricultural practices have become much more intensive um, and there have been greater demand for food and um, a lot of other specific products, insecticide use has um, gone up massively to maintain these yields. Um, one more notable pesticide and one that has been uh, that has also been in the media a lot recently is neonicotinoids. Um, during the last wildlife debate that was held by the Wildlife Trust, um, the discussion surrounded the resurgence of this chemical um, in order to combat virus yellows disease, uh, which targets sugar beet in, in England predominantly, um, and it's transmitted by aphids. Just to give a little bit of context, um, neonicotinoids are a systematic pesticide which is absorbed into every part of the plant, be that the stem for aphids or the flower for bees, for example. Um, they're relatively stable chemicals as well, which means that they persist in the environment as well as in um, their victims. Um, neonicotinoids were banned in the European Union in 2018 for these destructive impacts on the environment. So my question to Ellen is, is um, with the reintroduction of this damaging pesticide to combat virus yellows, what's actually stopping farmers from using the chemicals beyond their intended use if they're so great? Um, I completely understand where you're coming from, but I would just like to point out that it does not negate the fact that, our, that farmers do depend on pesticides. Um, farmers of sugar beet, for example, have seen losses of up to 80% of their yields um, due to virus yellows. Uh, to answer your question, I think that um, the use of, you need to remember that the use of these pesticides, like neonicotinoids, um, will be temporary and they'll also be highly regulated, more so than they were when they were initially banned in 2018. Uh, one of the other reassuring things is that I think farmers are a lot, a lot more conscious of their impact now, and so are people in general, than they have been in previous years. I think you could even take this further by educating more farmers and enforcing these regulations. I think that would also help us to see a rise in self-regulation and the agricultural sector might even become greener. For example, you mentioned the wild live debate uh, and in that a green farmer called Tom Clark highlighted the fact that only a minimal amount of these neonicotinoids will be used on crops. So that will hopefully limit their effect on the environment in instances where it is deemed necessary for these pesticides to be used. Um. OK, so you mentioned education um, and I completely get that because education can be a really powerful tool um, for gaining awareness um, around environmental causes um, and, you know, just to kind of um, batten down any ignorance surrounding um, uh, huge topics like this one. Um, 
I, I don't actually think that everyone will be on board with um, regulation and, edu uh, and education. Um, Tom Clark that you mentioned was a self-confessed environmentally friendly farmer, um, which is great. And I'm sure that there are a lot of others like him. Um, but the issue is, is that there's no actual guarantee that all farmers will respond to education um, or follow regulation if chemicals like neonicotinoids are far more cost effective for them and convenient. Okay, so if that's the case, then what would you propose that we could do instead? Um, well, there are plenty of other um, options for alternatives to pesticides, one of them being biological pest control. Um, where the natural predators of pests such as aphids, um, like lacewings, for example, are released into a field to control them. With lacewings, um, they can be bought commercially or um, as a bonus to the environment, you can actually attract them naturally by managing your fields in a certain way. Um, another really great example is companion planting, um, where instead of growing a single crop in your field, you grow different types. Um, where the um, additional crop will then act um, as a defense for more, uh, for more sensitive plants. A good example of this is um, tomatoes being planted alongside lettuce. Tomatoes will actually um, protect lettuce against um, pests such as diamond backed moth larvae. Um, I don't, uh, I think that these alternatives um, are much better for the environment because they don't involve harsh chemicals and I also think that they'll be much better for human health because as as we know, that pesticide residues have been found on goods. I would say that these all sound like fantastic solutions, um, but the issue is that most of these alternatives are not fully tested and we don't know the impact that they'll have on the yield. Uh, they're not always effective either. Um, in cases where lacewing populations have been introduced to combat aphids uh, in previous testings, the lacewings didn't survive long enough to effectively reduce the number of aphids. I think it's also important to think about the fact that viruses and the other effects of pest species is a problem that we are facing right now. Um, alternative methods that you've mentioned here are great for future use, but they're just not yet viable options. Okay, so you're saying that the diseases um, and other impacts are affecting crops right now, and that's completely valid but insect populations are suffering right now as well, if, you know, if not equally, if not more so. Um, so you've got to ask the question, why sacrifice the long-term impact of insect decline for crops that we could maintain through other methods? Um, in, your response, in response to your previous point about testing, that is completely fair because some of these methods haven't been tested enough for farmers to have confidence in them. Um, and you know, alternatives might be risky for them in terms of cost. Um, but you could then argue that reintroducing pesticides such as neonicotinoids um, might actually slow down essential research going into these alternatives. Yeah, I would completely agree with you on the fact that our insect populations are under threat, but that doesn't change the fact that our British farmers are still struggling. Uh, your concerns over the possibility of a slowing in the search for new eco-friendly methods is definitely well-founded but there are things that we could do to prevent it. I think continuing to have debates like these ones, perhaps increasing funding for research projects, and making sure that we apply deadlines on temporary allowances for pesticides like neonicotinoids um, would encourage the search for these eco-friendly options. And as I mentioned earlier, farmers are much more conscious of sustainability and the environment than they have been in the past. You know, you just have to look to organisations like the Nature, Nature Friendly Farming Network to see that. Uh, the motivation to explore these new options is there, it just needs more time. Uh, these alternative methods of maintaining crops, now until, until these methods of maintaining crops are found and are found to be effective, uh, we need pesticides to maintain our food security by keeping our yields up and to support the population and the economy. Um, I agree with what you're saying in terms of food security because pesticides do guarantee food security um, and they have done for decades and that's why we use them um, and this isn't just in the UK this is all over the world of course um, but um, do you know what else guarantees food security um, and that's pollinators 75% of the world's crops rely on insect pollination and so it's essential that we make the switch to less detrimental methods 
pest control to ensure that we can maintain pollination as a key ecosystem service for us. Um, some countries have already seen the consequences um, of um, reduced pollination. In the Sichuan province of China, pesticides are used extensively in order to um, meet demand for the pears that they grow. Um, because of their use, um, they've seen huge reductions of pollinators and farmers have had to start hand pollinating uh, the pear trees, which is incredibly labor intensive. If the cost to our pollinators, if the cost is to our pollinators, why should we grow foods like sugar beet, um, which isn't actually essential to human health? Uh, just to go to your previous point, I do think that pollinators are incredibly important. You know, you can't deny that, but they don't protect our crops in their initial stages. Um, and this is when the effect of pest species is usually at, at, is at, a, at its highest. Um, we need the use of controlled pesticides so that we can continue to access the variety of foods and goods that these crops help us to produce. And to answer your question, I think that we have to continue to grow crops like sugar beet, because even if we stopped growing them, the demand for those crops and the products that they produce would still be there. Um, the people still want these goods, and if companies can't get um, the supply here, then they'll just go to other countries for them. Uh, a lot of times in these countries, as you mentioned in China, for example, um, they often have different regulations than we have here in the UK. Um, and oftentimes they use pesticides that we've banned in this country. I think that it would be far better to grow things naturally where we can control what we use in a sustainable and progressive manner. I also like to highlight the fact that a lot of these crops are multifunctional. To use sugar beet as the example here, um, the ingredients produced from that are used in hand sanitizers, toiletries, and in animal feed. They're often products that are considered vital for a lot of people. I think we need these pesticides so that people can continue to access and afford these goods. Um, I'd argue that a lot of the products might actually be considered luxuries. Um, sugar beet has um, been known to um, be used to produce um, shampoos and lotions, um, which you could um either remove from your um your lifestyle or you could find easily find environmentally friendly alternatives um my argument is here is that consumers might not actually know what they're buying um and you know campaigns like um the meat free diet campaign or the plastic free campaign have seen huge successes where if people are actually given the information um, that they need where they actually know what they're buying people will choose to cut um, to cut those products out of their um, out of their lives or switch to better alternatives um, I do think people have it in them to make informed decisions about what they what they buy um, and if um, labelling or um, documentaries or, um, or other campaigns were actually made, I think people would choose to not buy products that have been made using pesticide sprayed crops. I think I'd have to agree with you here. I do think that a lot of people care too much about their luxuries. Uh, only small groups of people are conscious of their actions and uh, mindful of their purchases. I think if you're trying to encourage a majority of people to forego these products, then that's just unlikely. As you mentioned with the meat free diet campaign, some groups of people have been able to make the switch, but an even greater number of people don't. I think changing people's habits like this takes a lot of time. Even getting people to reduce the amount of meat in their diet they consume is really difficult. Uh, I doubt it would be different for other products like the ones created from these sprayed crops. I think the fact that insects are the ones that are being impacted also might affect people's decisions. Um, they're a lot less of a concern for people because I think fewer people find them cute, which I think is one of um, the biggest motivators behind people at least starting to look into these other options. Um, so I think they're just willing to make less sacrifices for them. Really interesting points in both of those sides of the argument. I can see how I can see where you both come from in different places. And I can see that the Q and A section is going a bit wild. Uh, so we'll definitely come to some of those questions at the end. So thank you so much, Megan and Ellen, um, for a really interesting debate. Uh, I just wondered if you had any final thoughts, sort of around the debate topics when you were 
research in them or any sort of answers or anything you came up with while you both sort of looked into your side of the debate? Um, I think one of the most important things that, um, that I learned is that um, education needs to be the key to um, actually gaining support not just for in, not just for the cause um, of reducing pesticides, but for insects in general. Um, and I think that um, I I do think that campaigns um, that involve people being more aware about the products that they buy is a possibility, um, particularly because we're seeing um, these really scary uh, headlines in the media and stuff. I think people might um, you know people might want to bring more awareness around it. Brilliant. Yeah. And what about you, Alex? Your, your side of this debate is so interesting coming from the, we haven't got the best alternatives yet. Did you learn any sort of major things? Yeah, I think I would have to agree with Megan on this one. I do think that education is probably the most important thing that we could do here. Um, educating people on the harmful impacts of pesticides, I think, would encourage regulation um, in cases where it is deemed necessary to use pesticides. And I also think that if we educate people on ways to develop alternatives, then that will provide more paths into a more sustainable future. Brilliant. Well, thank you both very much. Uh, we'll see Megan later on in the question and answer session. Thank you very much, Ellen, for coming along. Um, we'll go straight into our second debate from there because the link from Ellen and Megan's debate into the next one is quite obvious, actually. Uh, so I'd like to invite James and Jacob and Bethany uh, to come along. Uh, this debate's interesting because it's one that's based mainly in public perception and opinion. Uh, this debate's going to be very much focused on sort of what people perceive insects to be and what people believe are sort of conservation methods for insects. So the actual question that's going to be debated is, does people's perception of insects impact on their conservation? So because they look ugly or because people don't like them or because people are scared of them, does that actually impact on how much we want to conserve them for the future generations, even though we know that if we lose them, it will be a massive catastrophe for us. So Bethany and Jacob are going to be coming at this argument from, yes, it does impact them. Uh, and James is gonna be giving us a bit of a different sort of take on it, sort of looking into human behavior a little bit. Um, so I'd like to invite Bethany and Jacob first to introduce their side of the argument, please. Okay, um, add first like to make a statement that in the past decade um, media covered 1.3 percent um, of like topics related to climate change um, while only 0.02 of these referred to pollinator populations and of these 0.07 referred to insect decline. Um, I believe that this is a clear example that if people aren't speaking about this in the media um, and it's not being talked about as public opinion on them and talked about in public. Um, surely this would influence um, funding for projects which aim to conserve them. Ian, and uh, what about you, James? Um, I'd like, what's, what's your side of the argument for this debate? Um, I, from my side of the debate, I'm, I sort of, sort of agree that percep public perception does influence it, does have some impact, but Overall, I kind of think that, 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 that there are, are other reasons at the heart um, that override um, per, uh, perception of insects and bugs and pollinators. Um, other aspects like the people's upbringing, um, the, uh, people's basic values and beliefs. Um, and something that I uh, personally believe is that we are too overly negative about it, we sort of drown people out in hopelessness and despair at the situation that we face. And it kind of just makes people give up. Wow, so a very strong side on your James. So to get your debate started off then, the very sort of simple, again, sort of overarching question is, does people's fear of insects impact on their conservation? Um. I would personally say that absolutely, uh, yes, yes it does. Um, because a lot of people would look at an insect and think this is a scary thing or this is not a nice looking creature. I don't want to conserve that, but they are 
incredibly important, not only as pollinators, but, but for breaking up um, decomposing matter. Uh, without insects that break up the decomposing matter, um, there would be a huge buildup of dead organisms and not many plants would even be able to grow from the soil due to lack of nutrition. But um, to go sort of like back onto the topic a bit, uh, I do believe that it would be a lot easier to sort of protect these species if there was more sort of focus on them because they tend to get outshined by the cuter fluffy animals um sort of like the main species which get put up for conservation um i disagree that um in my research on human behavior um education very rarely leads to action it's it, it um it's actually yeah it's not it's not actually shoveling more information out there in, into the into the ether for people to to read and look upon look upon doesn't necessarily result in action um what actually caught, drives action um is people's basic beliefs and morals if people believe um if, if people value wildlife and value the environment they are more likely to be influenced into doing stuff um some and also some people don't value nature so if if, if people don't value nature um just more education isn't going to help um in my um in my from my own experience of learning um i looked into the illegal wildlife trade most of that most of the demand comes from people who don't who see nature from a more utilitarian purpose that nature is there for their use for their consumption they don't necessarily value it um yeah so that has that has more impact than just education That, that that has much more impact on on people's um, willingness to act. Okay, then. So you're coming at this from a very different perspective, James. And sort of you, you mentioned upbringing there a little bit. What what did you mean by that? People are taught um, to fear um, insects and view insects in a particular way. Um, one of the main causes of um, and. Uh, I even attempt it. The fear of um, insects. Um, most psychologists believe that it, it is taught at an early age. Um, so yeah. So upbringing and how um, and parentage is important in deciding people's perceptions on of insects. Interesting stuff. So, like Bethany, let's bring you back sort of into into this debate here as well. Do you do you agree with that? Do you agree with what's been said so far? I do kind of agree with what he's saying. Like, it does have stuff to do with your upbringing. But if you were brought up to like people not having the education you need on the insects and being like, this is what this bug does. Like, this is how it helps. People just see them and think, oh, it's got four legs and six eyes. Like, grows for squish it. Like many people have fears, say, in, I think James brought up in our practice about him having fear of sharks. Now, a lot of people have fears of wasps because they hack a powerful sting and for anybody they can cause, or for some people they can cause anaphylactic shock. Now, obviously with a shark, you can't really swat it and it, it, it avoids the issue. But with a wasp, you see it and you think, oh, that's going to sting me, just squish it. So I think it does have like a bit of an effect on the conservation side of it. But won't they? But don't they still understand how important that uh, that in, that that species is to the environment? Well, like you said, not if they've had the not so much the correct upbringing, but the correct understanding of the insects and like how they are to work in our ecosystem. I can I can I can agree to that, but I still believe that there are more important as there are more important reasons for why people act, uh, for why people may 
um, not want to conserve them, might not act to conserve them. Um, uh, reasons like how I brought up earlier about um, the sort of media cover coverage, the message that messages that we send out uh, to people that um, all, all of these problems it sort of overwhelms them. And there's also another aspect to this in that um, people can start to feel like it's their other people's problem. Um, as we were just talking earlier uh, by uh, Megan and uh, yeah, Megan and Evan, uh, that um, it's farmers spraying pesticides onto um, onto uh, onto their fields, killing insects. That that can have a negative impact on making people think it's somebody else's problem. Um, not and they don't realise that they can themselves help by doing uh, their own little pieces like gardening um, for what, and just generally providing habitat for insects. So overall percep and, and you don't have to have a favourable perception towards insects to want to do that kind of thing. Yeah, I 100% agree that um some people may be like sort of taught and brought up to think that it's another person's problem and it is that is quite a common problem with a lot of these sort of climate change um popular uh, species decline issues that a lot of people think oh they're going to sort it out and then those people think oh they're going to sort it out it's not a problem oh they're going to and it just goes on down a massive line but at the end of the day there has at the end of the day there has to be one specific point of that line which ends and surely it has to be up to someone and that someone's going to be the person who had the upbringing of wanting to raise these insects and bring their population back out of decline so surely this education aspect would be more useful in that sort of scenario I, I, I do agree with you there because I I have to constantly remind myself that um, my friends are all environmental scientists. The people that I surround myself with are sort of very knowledgeable in this. So I have to constantly remind myself that, uh, yes, the media coverage of environmental problems is pretty dismal so that most people might not actually know about the crisis that we face. So I do kind of agree with you there, Jacob. We are, we, we are we're, we're going to have to cut it there because it's been a fantastic debate and you kind of run straight into the time of it. Um, we're going to have you guys come along again for the question and answer session later on. So any questions and anything that people want to raise there, uh, they can raise. The question and answer thing shooting at, lots of people are asking them. So uh, we'll get around to those a bit later. Um, hopefully this time you'll, you'll get a chance to sort of say what you're going to say, Bethany, because I'd like to ask each of you individually what your final thoughts on this idea is of people's fear of insects is impacting on their conservation. Uh, so we'll start with you, Bethany, because you were talking before. What's your final thoughts on this whole issue? Um, I think that James bringing up a lot of good points. Oops, sorry. He's bringing up a lot of good points, but I still I still think that people's perception has, has a massive effect on their co conservation. Brilliant. Thank you, Bethany. And James, same to you. Have you learned anything throughout this process of research in your topic? Is there anything that you've brought out as like a key message? Um, I want to sort of like give you, give everybody here watching sort of something that they can take away from this, a, a way to take action. And from my study of human behaviour, um, when you want, it, um, when, when you're going to spread the word, uh make it make it something that's easy for them a lot of people have real world problems like and crisis and other things that might in to them be more important like work um raising their children so make it easy for them so my my, my thought was uh buy buy your neighbors buy your family uh buy people you meet meet in the street buy them seeds wildflower seeds and encourage them to um, grow them in 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 their um, in their gardens. Encourage them to leave uh, piles of dead wood for insects to grow in. So yeah, and just um, keep reminding them. Uh, people are more likely to take action 
if they're constantly reminded about it. So just 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 keep poking and prodding people to take actions. And yeah, that's my final thoughts. Brilliant. Thank you very much, James. And finally, over to you, Jacob. Uh, you led into this debate with that massive stat of 0.007% of all articles in this one study were about insect decline. So have you got any sort of major takeaway messages from what you've been talking about? Um, yes, and it's not as big as that first opening statement. It's sort of like closing it a bit more, like it's not as dramatic as that one. But yeah. it's, um, it's mainly the fact that current insect conservation just isn't doing enough right now. It's doing a lot, but it's not going to be enough to bring them back out as insects are still facing a decline, even with the current amount of conservation, which is going on, and that there needs to be more people involved with this. So um, I 100% agree with James, planting wildflowers uh, seed wildflower seed packets are like the best way to go because they're easy they don't inconvenience like too much it's literally just five seconds rip the seed packet pour it out and then recycle it it's easy um so yes i 100 percent agree that they are the best way to go brilliant well thank you very much you three uh very very interesting subject and uh, something that i'm sure a lot of people have questions about later on so yeah thank you very much you three um, we're going to go straight now as well into our final topic, which has been brought to us by two people from Bangor University Conservation Society. Uh, so Patricia and Sara, you can come along now. So Patricia and Sara are going to be debating something a little bit higher level, shall we say. Uh, we're going to be talking in this debate about pollinators, um, but we're going to be coming at it from two slightly different types of pollinators. So. Patricia's side of this debate argument is going to be that we need to put more focus and almost all of our focus into biodiversity and wild pollinators and that if we put all of our effort into bringing all insects back and sort of putting our effort into biodiversity, then we will face a better situation for food security and etc in the future. Uh, whereas Sada is going to be saying that actually we need to be focusing on short term solutions and agricultural pollinators. So. I hope I haven't said too much about your um, your side of the debates there, sort of Sada and Patricia. Um, but I'd like to in invite you, Patricia, first to sort of introduce your side of this debate and sort of what uh, what side you're coming at it from, please. Yeah, I'd love to. Yeah, as um, Andy also touched on earlier, I just want to say that, of course, insects provide so many ecosystem services like recycling dead plant and animal matter back into the ecosystem. They allow plants to reproduce and they are a food for innumerable species. And um, yeah, life would basically not exist without them. And there are multiple interacting causes of decline in in insects and pollinators and disentangling those causes is not always easy and some of those include of course global warming and different types of pollution like uh, light noise and air pollution of course and it's just really imperative that we conserve this diversity. Brilliant. Thank you very much Patricia and then Sarah if you'd like to introduce your side of this debate as well please. Yeah hi everyone for me the real problem are pests and disease especially for honeybees and we all could see that since Varroa was accidentally uh, introduced in Europe, colonies have seen uh, a decrease in fitness because mites lower apis for immune system uh, efficiency. And this translates into a higher incidence of mortality, uh, winter mortality and diseases in general. And so if beekeepers want to keep on working and harvest honey, uh, we need more efforts to be put into research against Varroa and implement beekeeping techniques. Brilliant. So Patricia, do you want to come straight in and answer it? Go for it. Yeah, I just fumbled with my mic. Sorry. <laughs> um, yes, I definitely agree that Varroa causes such huge problems considering just how how much pollination these species do. Um, but I would also just like to draw attention to the fact that Apis mellifera and other agricultural insects that work on our crops um, are actually vectors for disease and a lot of pathogens to native pollinators. And that's actually another one of those really big causes for pollinator decline. And we really have to protect that diversity too. 
because they could in turn actually control pest populations more naturally? Well, I think that we still have to concentrate on agricultural pollinators because those are in real reproductive species. And a study found that only in a small minority of common bee species provides uh, the crop pollination that we need. And it means that few species are actually needed to pollinate our crops with almost 80% of the crop pollination provided just by 2% of, of bee species. Well, I think that when we use a wider biodiversity of pollinators, we can actually reduce the impacts of these diseases and pests on those key species by having more support in the ecosystem. And I really think that if we neglect these other pollinators, we could lose those really important ecosystem services um, that those species contribute to. And it's actually even been shown that certain solitary bees uh, can actually pollinate crops more efficiently compared to individual honeybees, but because their populations aren't so as large as a whole hive and they don't produce that economically valuable honey, um, we just have not been able to, to utilize them in our current system. And I think it's also quite reductionistic to only look at crop plants because there's a whole nother biodiversity of plants too. Um, and sometimes those require species specific pollination. And if we lose those specific species of pollinators, then we get a decoupling of these evolutionary relationships and we can see extinctions mirrored in plant populations too. I think it depends on what you care about to a certain extent, because you talk about far consequences in the future and uh, weather causes, and I agree on a certain extent, but I prefer to concentrate on short term and practical implications, and we need agricultural uh, pollinators. Also, going back to when you mentioned um, pests and diseases, at a certain degree, I could say that beekeepers can still rely on specific treatments against Varroa, but this is not enough. Plus, there are, um, there are also main, uh, um, many breeding programs that promise to select bees with a uh, specific hygienic behavior. Uh, so it means that they could like clean varroa more efficiently and that could be uh, indeed more resistant to varroa. But if you consider also that conflict already exists and we can see it even on the different per perspective, uh, uh, con uh, conflict exists into farmers, conflict exists between beekeepers uh, when it comes to practice, like managing hives, and we need practical and quick measures to uh, comply with beekeeping as an economic um, activity. Well, I think it's very interesting that you mentioned those bee breeding programs. I think that while using more resilient strains of um, specifically crop species, but potentially also insects can be a good strategy. Um, this kind of breeding program can in the long term reduce genetic variability, which can uh, lead to reduced fitness in the long run, which is another reason why if these species do end up suffering, we need the backup of those wild pollinators. And I also think that if we rely so much on these treatments against pests, um, that we're, yeah, if we rely so much on them, that will make the animals more dependent on them. And if they prove also to be more unsustainable in the long term, then we're going to have even more issues. Um, and I think talking about pests, especially in agriculture, the, the use of pesticides is actually one of the biggest causes of insect decline, as, as we heard in one of the previous debates. Um, the damage is really widely assessed. Yeah, but pesticides are needed in agriculture at a certain extent, and there's no way, like feasible way to make it without it, uh, without them and still have a satisfactory yield. And how would you face it, for example, the disastrous year as one of the, uh, like the one that we just had here in UK? I mean, farmers are struggling uh, to carry on and government isn't doing enough to support them. Plus both pharmace in pharmaceutical companies and in research, there isn't really enough effort to search for alternative pesticides and uh, the know which extent they're actually being used. Mm, I actually really agree. Indeed, there is not enough effort to develop these alternatives. And that's actually the exact reason why I think the ban on pesticides 
um, needs to occur to incentivize the faster integration of these eco-friendly practices like integrated pest management or even the development of much, much safer pesticides. Um, and in the meantime, I think we're really just going to have to accept uh, lower yield. And I understand that that will affect the income of farmers, but I think that's really where the government needs to step in to give them that support um, so that they can make that switch. Um, and yes, really, I think we just need to integrate insect habitats and wildflowers into the agricultural systems that we have so that they can aid the insects. Yeah, but the problem uh, with intensive agriculture is that we rely on it because there is an intensive demand of products at low prices that couldn't be produced over the, otherwise. I mean, people want a wide variety of products all year round and want them for cheap. And when you say about accepting a lower yield, how, how could you actually do it? I mean, the price of food would rise. And what about those living below the poverty line who cannot afford this? I mean, it's easy to say to buy organic or to shop local, but it's not possible for everyone. Mm, okay, just to address your first point, I think the that we're aware that the intensification of agriculture has actually a, a lot of it has been since the second world war when we started using more monocultures and that's one of the big trends we see um, where that coincides with insect decline um, so in my opinion the further intensification is the last thing we need um, and the price of food they likely would go up but the, the price of food is already kept artificially low. The avocado that you get at the supermarket does not cost one pound. Someone out there is paying whether with money, their rights or their ecosystem. And just to touch on the poverty, that the people living on the poverty line, that is so important. And I think it's really a shame on our government that the quote unquote living wage would not be enough for people to buy the food that they need at the price that it really costs. And we really must educate consumers to encourage more conscious buying and voting, not only for the environment, but for the well-being of those people too. Well, I agree at a certain extent, certainly, but it seems such a long way to go through. I mean, and is, is it realistic? Plus, when you talk about the insect decline and in the media you hear about this insect apocalypse, I mean, is it true? Because it has been noticed by some researchers that there are considerable uh, biases in global distribution of, of insect uh, of insect demographic studies with the vast majority of long-term data that come from Europe and United States. And these, state, these areas collectively supply for just like 20% of uh, global insect diversity. So if we actually want to talk about insect decline, factor emphasis must be uh, placed on acquiring trend data for other areas like tropical areas and even, I don't know, Americas, Africa and Asia. So not just Europe and US. Plus in the history of hurt, I would say like evolutionary talking, uh, there, there have been many, many extinction cycles that led to exchange to the extinction, sorry, of many uh, less adaptable species. So in a certain extent, if many wild pollinators can cope with the change of the environment, maybe it's just natural selection. I definitely agree that there are wide gaps in our knowledge of insect decline, um, and we really do need standardization of sampling methods across nations so that we can see those unbiased trends. But from the things that we're seeing, the rate of insect disappearance really is getting faster and faster, and it really is just very unprecedented. Um, and <laughs> so sorry, mind blank. Yeah, and sorry. Um, and since that insects just haven't had the time to be able to adapt to that level of environmental change that, that we're conducting. And that's another really important thing that we need to communicate to the public. But what can public do in the end? I mean, uh, is planting flower enough? <laughs> At which extent putting hives in the cities and encouraging wildlife to come to urbanized areas is more useful for us, but not for them? I mean, plant, planting flowers and trees in urban areas is not enough. Could urban green areas even be an ecological sink? And when we talk about ecological sink, we mean uh, like we, we have the idea that a poor quality habitat 
uh, translates in bigger death and immigration of species than actually birth and immigration of species inside that area. So it means that food sources could draw pollinators into the area where different sources of pollution, such as light pollution, uh, could trap them there. And noise pollution is known to disrupt communication. Also, there is even more evidence that insect navig navigation is disrupted by radio frequencies and urbanized uh, areas are full of electromagnetic pollution. That's one of the reasons why um, I really focused on uh, pointing out earlier to educate the public because it really isn't enough to to plant flowers and trees especially if poor management of that could lead to further insect declines um, and insects should really not be paying the price for our unsustainable practices and if you'll forgive me for getting a little bit political our capitalism is not a meritocracy and those most worthy of merit our pollinators, our farmers, and our working class are among the most disadvantaged right now. And we must communicate this information to the public to empower the people to recognize these deep systematic issues in our society that, contra that has led to this huge wealth disparity and this degradation of our ecosystems so that people can finally demand the urgent change that is really needed from our government and then agricultural practices can satisfy the demands of nature too. Wow. <laughs> I'm stopping you there because we are again running over time, but a very powerful way to end that debate. And some really interesting sort of things there to start on pollinators to go to, you know, disparity, how much people can afford to go through rights and government. It's a really nice, really nice way to sort of go through everything. So well done for that. Um, same as the other debates as well, actually, I'd like to ask either, like, well, both of you, actually, um, did you learn anything or have you got any sort of major learning points from your debate or any sort of tips that you found out along the way for what people can do in terms of pollinators? Yeah, I'll go first, I suppose. There's there's plenty that I learned during during this. Um, and I suppose one of the, the big things is what, what can the public do right now? And there are quite a few things you can do. Of course, <laughs> you can plant, plant the flowers and the trees with, the, with, with guidance and even, even anywhere, it is still a help, um, lo most likely most of the time. But what you can do is, um, is you can write to your local MPs to um, really make them aware of these issues. You can choose to buy organic and that those products oftentimes have much more sustainable growing practices. And you can even get involved with, um, with campaigns like Pesticide Free Towns from Pesticide Action Network UK. Um, yeah, that's, that's what I'd like to say. Plenty there, loads there. Thank you, Patricia. Uh, what about you, Sada? Is there anything that you learned on your side? Yeah, in a certain way, um, I think that not to repeat what Patricia said, but also um, I think that beekeepers and agricultures could also start to work together because what I see, like not just in UK, but even in other countries uh, coming from abroad, is that uh, those two uh, areas, those two sectors, because actually they should collaborate, but they're so contraposed to each other. So, uh, but they need each other because uh, even if we say, okay, we, we don't like farmers and everything like intensive agriculture, I think there's a way of balancing and they should start communicating in a productive way. Brilliant. Wow, powerful stuff, both of you. Well done. Thank you very much for giving us that debate. Uh, our questions are flying up again. So, um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'll just say a few words then now. Um, Sarah and Patricia, you might as well stay on because I'm going to need you anyway. So uh, we'll go straight into the question and answer bit. Don't worry, Sarah. Um, I think now that we've got um, we've gone through all the debates, they were fantastic debates, really, really good. And I'm so grateful and proud of all the young people who've come together to actually do so much research on their own sort of specific debates and their side of it. Um, it's really nice to get so much unbiased viewpoints to a single issue, which is something we don't often get when we start research and we start thinking about things. So um, thank you all, to all of the young people. I'm inviting you all back now, as well as Chris Wynn, um, because we're going to go straight into our question and answer session next, um, just to keep the ball rolling while everything's still fresh. Um, what I'm going to start with, there's been loads of questions coming in and our tech support has very kindly sort of gone through some of the questions to sort of pull them out uh, as well. So um, what we're going to start with um, is what is a green farmer? Are they organic or is green a different categorization? Now, who wants to take that one? 
Oh, Patricia, come on. Um, green doesn't, from what I have seen and, and learned, uh, green farming and a lot of things that are labeled green do not actually have any any regulations behind it and there's actually a really big issue with something called greenwashing where companies will will package things or say certain things to make them seem more environmentally conscious because they know that there is a market for people that do want that but in fact a lot of their practices are still very unsustainable so you do need to look into it a little bit more. I know it's not not very very fun, but uh, any effort is is greatly appreciated and needed. Something else to add to there as well. Uh, what I'd like to do next as well, very quickly, is um, I see Chris down the bottom there. Uh, we're going to give Chris Wynn just a little bit of an opportunity to explain sort of what he does at the North Wales Wildlife Trust as well, uh, and then I'm going to follow that up with a question that I've got for Chris as well. So Chris, do you want to say a quick hello? Hi, yeah. Hi, everyone. Yeah. Uh, so I'm Chris. I'm the um, senior reserve manager for the North Wales Wildlife Trust. Been with Wildlife Trust for a while, um, and I oversee the management of all our nature reserves, of which there are 36, uh, include a wide range of habitats, everything from coastal lagoons and shingle beaches to upland heathlands and Celtic rainforests. Um, yeah, so it's a very interesting job. Um, lots of diversity having to deal with management of sites for all manner of things um the cute and the furry and the feathery and the, the slimy and the multi-legged um which is one of the things that makes it a challenge and, and never ceases to be a challenge because there's always something new to learn which is one of the reasons i really love what i do um and rather than waiting for randy to ask me a question i'm going to jump straight in and sort of pick up on some of the points that I saw on the uh, some of the questions that were being asked. And that was about um, this whole question around using charismatic species and um, and why people aren't interested in invertebrates. Well, I might as well be controversial, but I think it's a bit, it, it's almost like it just shows how superficial can, people can be. Because when you start to look at invertebrates and insects in particular, you just realise how totally fascinating they are in terms of their their lifestyles, how they live, where they live, what they feed on, what their life cycles are like. And it, you know, the more I hear about some of them and how specialized they can be, the more it just like fascinates me completely. And that is what inter is interesting about them is just if you can use these as stories to tell people, it doesn't matter the fact that they've got, you know, however many legs they've got, what they look like, you know, they are absolutely fascinating and the role they play in giving us somewhere to live and giving us the food that we eat and the places that we love. Um, it's just amazing. So, yeah, I think, yeah, just drop it in there, Andy. <laughs> get me Brilliant. with a tricky question. No, that's fine. Now. <laughs> <laughs> I on. mean, it's, it's an important, it's, it's, it is an important point that you raise there, like you say, the, um, when we talk about sort of poster species, we think pandas, we think tigers, we think snow leopards, we think all these things. Um, and there's no sort of, I think it, as it came up with Jacob, there's no, species which is there as a sort of poster child for the insect world so i don't know if you've got any thoughts on that jacob as well if you can find us no, I, 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 <laughs> yeah i um i 100 um agree with chris that they are fascinating once you get like that initial interest in them but to get that initial interest it's a little bit tricky but once you've got it you're just hooked you just wanting to find out as much as possible about brilliant mm. very true they are very very interesting and as you say when you get up a close i think jumping spiders is my favorite when you get a very close view of a jumping spider just absolutely adorable um so the next question we've had in from the people watching um it was to ellen so megan i'll sort of direct it to you because you might have come across it in your research it's a very interesting point actually um sort of they brought out that we, we sort of mentioned that sugar beet was used in sort of products and sort of lotions, shampoos, that sort of things. And there's a question here asking if we know if labeling initiatives exist to disclose that information on the label. Um, I imagine in terms of things like pesticides as well. So a few people might have dipped into this. Does anyone know? I haven't actually seen any kind of labeling campaigns for um, pesticides, which is really interesting actually, because, you know, um, we've had, um people talk about residues and everything as well so not just for like the um the benefits of insects but you think they put it on there for like um safety for people 
Um, I think the closest kind of labeling thing you might get is organic, um, but then they do, they can use chemicals and stuff on organic food sometimes. So I think it might just be down to individual research or local food, uh, local shopping from like um, farm shops, if you can access them or growing your own food, because then you know exactly what you're putting, uh, putting on them. Um, and another thing that I found that was interesting is when it comes to residues, not necessarily like, um, but also insects as well, um, is it's actually the, on the onus of um, businesses that supply food. Um, so like supermarkets or restaurants to know what the pesticide levels are on the food they supply. So um, if they were forced to disclose that, that might be a way to kind of, um, get people on board with supporting certain businesses that use less pesticides on the food they buy or or that kind of thing. Brilliant, really interesting stuff actually. It's something that we'll definitely look into a bit more as well because like say you know like organic things like fair trade for things about people's rights and things like that but um, the labelling one's very interesting ones we don't actually see I've never seen don't recall ever seeing pesticides on a label so we'll do a bit of research there and find out. Uh, we've got a really good question here for something that James raised as well, actually, about um, sometimes you feel overwhelmed. There's all these different environmental things going on, and um, it's been sort of dubbed eco-anxiety, I can tell you. Um, and it's something that anyone working in the environmental sector will have felt at some point. Um, and anybody who has any like sort of connection to the environmental sector will feel at some point. Um, because like you say, it's just sort of, even with the insect apocalypse, it's been dubbed death by a thousand cuts because of how many different things are affecting insect populations. Um, the thing that's been pointed out, James, um, in sort of that is, is there any way to engage more young people with all of this, with education, to sort of, of, of probably avoid that um, that feeling of eco-anxiety, but also to bring people together, especially young people, um, to get people involved? I would be a bit more abstract in the possible negative side effects to it. Don't depress them, um, <laughs> basically, basically. Are you yeah. advocating for blissful ignorance there, James? No, rather than uh, have a, uh, focusing on all the negative aspects of it, uh, give them some positive um, side. Tell, tell them what they can do um, and, and encourage them to do it. Don't, don't just um, tell them this, 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 this is going to happen. Oh, and by the way, there's, there's a side effect of you dying. Don't, don't, don't be that negative. Just uh, tell them that there are ways that they can help, um, like through the ways that I've told you, planting uh, wildflower seeds, uh, providing more habitat for insects, encouraging your neighbours to do more actions to help them. So, yeah. I think that, um, it's Chris here, I think what we should do, we should really draw a distinction between what sort of the major media, uh, let's say, whether you know newspapers or radio or television about the issues and how they deal with it and how organizations such as the wildlife trust approach it in terms of their engagement with people and our, our approach is very much you know about building people's fascination with in this case with insects and that can be with anybody you know it can start at a young age you can do it with school children and we do a lot of work with even primary school children um talking to them about insects, about wildflowers and their roles they play, about butterflies, and there's all sorts of stories that you can tell around that. You know, we don't need to tell that story, you know. I, I get what you mean, James, about being doom like mongers all the time and just having the bad news story. There are so many good things we can talk to people about. And when it's, particularly when it's on like, when you're on a guided walk or you're doing a talk, you can just talk about the things that are fascinating and that are interesting. But, you know, you can also use the opportunity just to give a really good example of what the issue is. You know, and, and there's nothing that highlights it more for me is if you go on a w guided walk on a, a nature reserve or around anywhere that's good for insects and then you go across an agriculturally improved field you can see the difference immediately and you can see where one of the issues is, is you know, about that loss of habitat and the way land is managed and how that can affect wildlife but you know but you don't need to focus on the on the bad news stories particularly when you're dealing with people at, at the personal level and that's when you can make the difference that we, that's where you can build this fascination you know not i think you, you mentioned the point not only with young people but with you know with grown-ups even mm. you know people can change their mind people can develop an interest yeah at, at a young age it is so important to to develop the fascination because that's when they are 
more influence support their their values and their beliefs that I was talking about in my um, in my debate. That that is so important to build a good a good basis for what because uh, their but their beliefs and their values influence their behaviours and their actions, their likelihood to uh, take action, their likelihood to uh, do things like that that help um, conserve insects. Brilliant. Uh, Patricia, did you raise your hand to come into this engaging young people as well? Um, it was for a little bit earlier, but I was going to quote more more depressing stuff, so I thought <laughs> maybe I'll... Bad time, bad time. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant, that's fine. Um, okay then, so um, following on from sort of engaging young people and things like that, we've also had a question asking, uh, do you think that if schools took children outside more to engage and learn about insects from a young age, and we could solve the problem of people's perceptions of them and improve conservation for insects. Um, I think we touched, we basically we touched upon it with um, James and Chris, but yes or no? What do we think? Hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like James and Chris have said, like, like you can learn it at any age, but when you're young is when you're really more susceptible to being curious and wanting to learn about all the different things and it's when you're mo more likely to just want to get outside and look at all of this interesting wildlife and see what it's all about because y you've not if you're like really young it's going to be new and exciting and it'll have a lot of novelty to it to begin with and then you'll learn it a bit more as you get older and then get into more detail on it, learn the different species, learn their different lifestyles and stuff, and then it will just progress from there. So yes, start from a young age. <laughs> I can still remember when I went pond dipping and all that kind of stuff and then holding these, uh, these little uh, insects and all that kind of stuff in my hand. So yeah, definitely. Brilliant, great. I, yeah, I agree. Yeah, get people get people looking at insects from an early age. Absolutely. Um, the next question is directed um, to Patricia and Sarah. It's um, straight off the back of your debate, um, and it's someone who's asked if they do you think using pesticides just strategically to create pesticide resistance amongst our pollinators is an option for the future. I think it's an interesting question, actually, but I, I. I mean, at a certain extent, I would say yes, but even no, <laughs> because I don't know how you would uh, be sure that you're developing uh, tolerance, because it's really, there's a subtle line between, because you can see some little effects, but the problem really with the uh, systemic uh, pesticides and neonicotinoids, for, for example, is that you have those like chronic sublittle effects that is like the small exposure like day by day, time by time, in, it, it is even more disruptive to the colon itself than the little doses. So um, on a certain extent, like theoretically, it could be like a great thing, but uh, I think it's even creating more problem to the problem that we already have, because I think it would be uh, hard to manage, like technically speaking, to, to do. Mm. Yeah, I think I think this kind of, engages the idea of the breeding programs and the idea of um, making these species more resistant. And I think it would be good to have more resistant species, but like Sarah said, I think it would be really difficult to manage. And I think especially uh, if it isn't the, the more common uh, you know, agricultural insects, because these, these pesticides do leach into into adjacent ecosystems and like our our ponds and waterways and they for example are quite affect aquatic invertebrates there too as well as um the things that eat them and like otters and everything so i think it would just be extremely difficult to um to create that resistance in such a wide diversity of species james you got your hand raised up there yeah, I was just concerned that if we talk, if we're going to start talking about developing resistances, we are also probably more uh, just as likely to develop uh, resistant strains within our the, the the targeted species, the species that we don't want uh, to gain um, resistances. So I just thought I'd just like um, comment on that. 
that you that, that you're also equally mm -hmm. going to get resistances in um, what you don't in the species you don't want. Right. It's, it's very interesting. It's very highly very highly technical and things where things have gone wrong in the past as well. Um, Jacob, you raised your hand about a millisecond before Chris did there, so I'll let you go next. Um, I was I, I was um obviously like I don't know everything about insects. I was just wondering how we would go about like um increasing resistance in the pest since it's obviously sort of an interesting topic. I'm a bit confused as to how we would go about doing that. Oh well, Chris has got his hand raised next, so maybe Chris wants to elaborate on that as well while he answers this asks his next question. Um, well, I was just going to pick up on the point that was made a few minutes ago about you know the vast number of species that would we would be talking about um, that we would need to develop the resistance in. You know, I think someone was saying earlier on two thousand three hundred and forty species of insects in the UK. You know, so how the question is how do we select them and surely a better approach is through the the better use and management of um, the pesticides in the first place. And that was the point I was going to make, really. I would also add uh, that you do not only have many species of insects, like a huge variety, but you also do not have only one pesticide. You have a huge variety of pesticides themselves. So like efficiently having uh, insects that are resistant, it's, I don't think it's feasible. And to try to answer to Jacob's uh, question, because it's not directly my topic, but the, basically you develop, you develop resistance because through generation and through exposition, uh, the organism just become stronger because um, sometimes you get the dose that is enough to kill them, but sometimes even if you use, if you use a smaller dose, they can try, some of them die, but some of them, uh, some of them cope with it. So the next generation are just gonna be more resistant. It's uh, anything that could also change with us with antibiotics. For example, when you take antibiotics and we don't need them, our body just develop resist, like our body develop resistant and even the, the bacteria or the virus. Really glad you brought that up. I was thinking just the same thing. Really interesting one. To bring it sort of back down a bit, again, sort of directing this question towards you, Chris, because I think you might know a little bit more. It's just come up in the chat. Um, do you know of any laws protecting habitat, well, protecting insects, essentially? Obviously, they say that bats and squirrels have laws protecting them specifically. Are there any for insects in Wales? Uh, yes, yeah, so there will be a, a number of species that are protected directly through the Wildlife and Countryside Act, and that would include um, a few of the very rare ones, um, thinking of some of the, um, I think a, a good example would be marsh fertility butterfly, which would be protected from uh, damage, uh, um, usually in its habitat, but also more generally, insect habitats would be protected through the Site of Special Scientific Interest Network. Uh, which provides a degree of protection um, for a whole range of invertebrates. Um, there would be also some other indirect means as well through the planning system. So where you get a development that might affect a site that was of value for wildlife, you could get protection of the insects through the planning system. And local authority planning systems and their uh, planning documents usually have some element to do with, with biodiversity, and that will relate back to um, the Environment Act for Wales and some of the species that are listed in that, that we will be given a degree of protection through that. So there's a variety of mechanisms that can be used to protect insects. Brilliant. That's a great answer. Thanks, Chris. Um, to bring it back down a bit, we've obviously we've talked about pest resistance and we've talked about laws and stuff like that. Um, we've been asked a question about media and uh, specifically about TV shows about insects. Um, people asking that, do we feel like having more sort of awareness, having, having more of a, a presence on TV in things I imagine like Richard, like David Attenborough, um, Blue Planet style thing about insects would have any bearing or impact on their conservation in the future? Depends who's conveying the message. Um, I think we had someone, someone's uh, suggested um, entomologists like George McGavin. Um, yeah, that could uh, that could work, but it, um, in this uh, in in this age of like hyper um, partisanship and like mistrust in the in the media, it's, it's often important that um, 
it's more important who is giving the message uh, rather than uh, like um, than what the message is, because you're more likely going to act if it's somebody that you trust and it's someone that you know is respected, like like David Attenborough. Um, um, I think also Chris Packham was. Uh, am I correct? Is it Chris Packham who's been doing a lot it's, of work? It's an interesting point you're raising there. So you, so you say that the, the the person delivering the information is more important than the information itself. Yes. Yeah. In 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 psychology and people's be in psychology and people uh, and in 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 behavioural psychology, um, who um, who who you met who is conveying the message is more important than the message itself. Wow. So yes, I, I, def I, I definitely agree with it. If we have, it, it needs to be someone who's trusted, but it's also ne needs to be someone who um, is not who, who who is known within the public. Cool. We've got two raised hands, James. I'm going to stop you there and go straight to Jacob. <laughs> I could talk for ages. <laughs> um, I was uh, just going to say that it also depends on like the context of what the video would be. For example, like if it's more geared up towards nature enthusiasts who are already passionate about wildlife and the environment, then yes, someone who's done a lot of nature documentaries and stuff would be a very good choice for that. But, it, but if it's more directed as someone who's just thinking about getting into nature, then someone who could maybe convey it in a more simplified tone without using all the advanced uh, terms would probably be more suited for like younger generations who haven't spent all this time getting degrees and stuff in rare species of birds and stuff um, and don't understand these technical terms it might be better for someone who can simplify it down to them so the language used in it would also matter based on context language is definitely important jargon is something that's massively prevalent <laughs> prevalent uh, in this sort of arena like lots of people working with environmental stuff absolutely uh megan um you've had hand raised for a while i don't know how to take it down now there we go. <laughs> um i don't want to i really don't want to like bring the mood down <laughs> so prepare um but i feel like depending on what the message of a particular tv show would be i feel like we've missed the boat on that one I feel like if we wanted to create a really powerful and really poignant documentary on insects and the impact pesticides have on them and the impact habitat loss has on them, then it should have been made near to the Blue Planet 2 kind of period because there was massive, um, that had such an impact on everyone who watched it. And that might've had something to do with like where it was, um, um, where it was broadcast, which is the BBC, which probably really helped it, but it had like, huge gravity um, and I've seen the David Attenborough documentaries that have happened since then and I don't feel like they've had such an impact because we've almost been bombarded with powerful documentaries um, and they're all of amazing standard and they all have really really good messages um, but and the most powerful one for me was the one that he did on Netflix um, which was his um, I forgot what it was called. It was like um, a last um, testament or something like that. I can't quite remember. But it did. It wasn't talked about as much, and that was the most powerful message I've seen him make. And that's a bit of an issue. If the most powerful message that has been made, I feel like to date about the state of the planet, isn't talked about as much as something that was made a few years ago. Um, but I feel like if you you could make it in a certain way, that might be more geared towards um people that have been uh, that might be bogged down by kind of like eco depression you might be have to um do it in such a way where it's pointed to the more positives um as like solutions rather than just saying these are what the problems are and we've got three we've got three hands raised i'm going to answer those that you'll go to you three guys if you can keep it quickly as, as you can we've got one more question before we come to the end uh, i'll say as well netflix uh, there's other streaming available in other places not that not just netflix is available uh, patricia first and then james and chris 
Okay, I'll keep it quick. Um, I first wanted to say that there actually was a insect-based David Attenborough series called Life in the Undergr Undergrowth, and it wasn't very popular, but it's amazing and everyone should go and watch it. And I also just wanted to say really quickly about all the really negative representation that insects have had, um, you know, the whole thing of like, book wars, deadly, um, they're going to damage all your stuff, they're disgusting, they're scary. Um, I think that's also done a huge, huge amount, amount of harm. Um, yeah, and I really hope that there is more positive representation, especially in children's media. Agreed. Uh, uh, James was obviously, it, it must have been that James was going to say exactly the same thing as you. So we'll go straight to Chris Wynn. <laughs> um, I was just going to uh, just really mention that, you know, you can, there have been very successful um, books that have made a big difference. All you've got to think of is Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, which was about the use of pesticides that made a big difference to the whole environmental movement. So, you know, we shouldn't focus solely on the TV as, a, as the means to deliver a message about how important invertebrates and insects are and how important the environment and wildlife is. You know, at the moment, I think we're at a point where people really appreciate their local environments and their local wildlife. And now is the time to make the most of it and get people interested in everything from the dawn chorus to the insects that are out there and the, insect, the birds feed on as well. So, you know, we shouldn't miss these opportunities, you know. And there are children's books that, that can help us with that. Um, okay, the hungry caterpillar is perhaps um, not ecologically or entomologically correct, but it gets children interested in, in butterflies. Brilliant example. Thanks, Chris. Yeah. Um, the, okay, so the last question I'm going to ask all of you guys for a discussion is, um, is a small thread in the middle of the questions talking about um, using, obviously, insects as poster species. Um, someone suggested that um, perhaps if insects aren't seen as the most desirable thing, that we should use other species that rely on insects, i.e. birds, swifts, that sort of stuff, instead as poster species to conserve insects. Discuss between, you, between yourselves. What do you think? Yes or no? Um, I think there's actually already a term that slightly describes that. Um, it's the idea of an umbrella species. Uh, and for example, they're, they're usually the more charismatic, you know, usually a mammal and their ranges are usually a lot bigger. So if you give them protection, then that can protect the habitats of a lot of species that, um, that, that live adjacent to them. Chris? That's just a little quick overview, sorry. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> All right, thanks, Andy. Um, I sort of wonder whether we actually really need to be focusing on species. You know, we live in a connected world, and perhaps the message we should be talking about is one of connectivity in the natural world, you know, and how everything is related to each, everything else, you know. Okay, swifts feed on insects that are flying, you know, sometimes thousands of feet above us, and there's, you know, there's big clouds of them, um, but also how they're related to plants, but also about our connectivity to the natural world as well and, and so we should perhaps be focusing on that and rather than sort of you know drilling down and looking at individual species we should be thinking about the ecology of the world that we live in as a whole and, and how it all links together because that is what is in danger of just crumbling away as we mess up various bits of it poignant chris thank you very much <laughs> um, thank you Andy. <laughs> um I was just going to say that, yes, I 100% agree with Chris that it is quite important that we don't just take certain parts of nature because that's not what nature is. It's this giant sort of intricate web of different species and different environments, which definitely needs, all of it needs protecting, but some areas do need it more than others. So it, it would sort of be about like, it would be a bit more complicated to focus on just the individual species in a given environment than to focus on the entire environment, which is probably why it'd be best to do habitat conservation as opposed to single species conservation. Absolutely, yeah. Um, Sara? I wanted to say quickly that um... I totally agree. <laughs> I also agree with Chris and Jacob and this like these all ideas. And just wanted to mention that even in the in like research areas, there's um, they're starting to do this. 
uh, in the sense that I'm actually studying what we already know from like uh, primary school, you know, when you study the circle of life and everything is connected as Chris was saying. And there was the papers from years ago that they were studying um, how a decrease in insects near a uh, farmland were, uh, was also implying a decrease in uh, like birds going around because of course you don't have, uh, if you don't have enough insects to feed the birds, then the birds won't come and we, we just uh, depopulate the area. So, I mean, um, it's obvious in a certain way, but I think that it's nice that research is also keeping an effort to study with data because sometimes just people, uh, especially nowadays when we have a lot of uh, those uh, different article and papers that pop up, um, people really need uh, uh, data and statistics to rely on something which is a shame at a certain degree, but still it's good that even in research area they're starting to do it and to show this connection. Absolutely, brilliant, thank you guys. Um, so just very finally then, sort of just two minutes long, um, it'd be nice to finish on to, uh, a positive. Um, so for everyone watching tonight and for everyone who's going to be watching on YouTube afterwards, um, what can people do at home to just help a little bit with the insect decline and insect the apocalypse? Anybody? I'll start, <laughs> shall I say something again? Go on Chris, yeah, go yeah, on. However small your garden, however much space you've got, you can plant something that will attract insects. Uh, a few wildflowers in a pot. Just, just do that as much as you can and just wait and see what comes and just enjoy what comes. You don't have to know the name. You probably get some hoverflies, but just enjoy watching them. And on a nice spring morning, summer morning, just watch what comes. So yeah, just plant a few seeds. It's great fun. Megan? Um, I'd probably say um, write to your MP to um, find out what their, their thoughts are on the issue and see if you can encourage them to change their minds slightly in favour of insects because it, it's needed. Um, and I also think um, we've talked about it a lot is instilling values in the young people um, that you know, in the young people in your lives because young people are the future who are going to inherit whatever world is left for them um, and whatever values they have going forward could change things for the better. Brilliant, thank you. And Patricia, we've got a final word. Are you on mute? <laughs> thank you, sorry. You can get involved with the Pesticide Free Towns campaign by Pesticide Action Network UK, and I'm just going to post a link in the comments. I hope that works. Go for it, yeah. Just click next to all uh, everybody, it says all panelists, it should do. Oh, Sara, you got, okay, go on, Sara, then, go on. <laughs> super quick, uh, super quick. As uh, also we said in our debate, of course, planting flowers and like because every small thing matters, uh, but also we have to be conscious of the impact that we have as buyers when we go to a supermarket. And we, I mean, it's not it's not possible for anyone, but uh, maybe for someone is to um, try to know where they eat, not just for themselves, but. Uh, for a long-term food chain production because it because the demand like the the chain changes when the demand changes and the demand changes when we buy consciously brilliant right thank you all so much for pulling together all of your debates and taking part in this question and answer it's been a really great it's been a really great event actually really interesting stuff um, there's been lots of links being sent out by our techie people behind the scenes, um, i.e. Jake, who has been sending out lots of links to some interesting bits and bobs that you can all sort of get involved with. Um, so things like wildlife gardening, things like other events coming up at the Trust. Uh, remember, for all these types of events and things, you can always go to the North Wales Wildlife Trust website. So it's northwaleswildlifetrust.org.uk. Um, but the easiest way to get news of all these events that are coming up and things that you can do at home is to just go to the North Wales Wildlife Trust website and then sign up to the e-newsletter. Uh, we put lots of our debates, campaigns, events, and sort of what you can do at home in there. So please go and do sign up to that e-news. Um, there is also a sort of a, an insect specific petition out at the moment, um, sort of anti-neonicotinoid, um, which has been circulated by the Wildlife Trust. Um, so if you pop into Google and type in the Wildlife Trust's neonicotinoids, uh, you'll find a position there which is going to go to government very soon, um, which has been taken up quite a big time by a lot of communities around the UK. 
Um, and just as a very final word, I just want to say thank you to everybody for coming along. Uh, I hope you've all enjoyed it. Um, our young people, like I said, all the he people here and the other people who aren't on this question and answer panel, um, put a lot of effort into this event. And um, we're really happy that we could get as many people coming along as we can. So thank you very much for coming along. And enjoy the rest of your evening, everybody. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you, everyone.